ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, Pulse Exchange 10th birthday party. Um, it's great to see so many people here. Uh, as we reach uh, 10 years of age, uh, I think it's a sign of our, our growing maturity as an organization instead of having solutions. Take cakes and jelly, you are instead treated to the slightly more adult pleasure of a speech by the uh, Minister of the Cabinet Office. It's like dry pleasure, perhaps. Um, I, have, uh, I have a particular pleasure in introducing Francis, because of course, um, if you're working, you don't have a, a, a job, uh, which is this. <laughs> and more importantly, of course, the government's uh, agenda, it's fair to say, will be uh, a lot less uh, interesting because a lot of uh, the most exciting things that the government will be doing, be it the pupil premium, free schools, or collective police accountability, are, if you can, I think, uh, traced directly back to policy exchange back from the last 10 years, which is uh, quite a thing. And indeed, the work goes on. I mean, we are doing huge number of different things at the moment. For us at the moment, the top priority of course is jobs and growth. Uh, all the way through the years of the debt people boom, we have 5 million people of working age on our work benefits. And so that's why we're doing a huge program of work on reforming the benefit system to make it more tailored or activating and more demanding employment. Thinking about uh, jobs and growth in other ways too, thinking about how we can deregulate, how we can, for example, reduce the cost of going green, green and cheaper, a series of payments. Thinking about financial reform, Things to do with uh, remuneration, those kind of issues, but also how we can get credit flowing through through the economy again as well. And also thinking about housing and planning. I mean, the big thing uh, people say about the British economy is that compared to some of our competitors, we have a much more rich planning system. Very difficult to get anything built here. And that's one of the reasons why the cost of housing since 1995 has trebled, pushing up the cost of living for everyone and also pushing up the cost of government. At the same time, we're still pushing ahead on uh, reforms of public services. Uh, only the week we put on our paper on uh, social enterprise schools, bringing in for profit providers into the state sector for the first time in the form of mutuals. We've been thinking about police efficiency. We have in a lot of offices, we have a model of third offices, one of the main single arrests in the last year, because we're paying very expensive police officers to sit in that room. Thinking about how we can uh, build on uh, the police commissions once they're elected in November, how we can perhaps move from having police commissions to justice commissions that would be responsible for prisons too for crime prevention, so we can start to be more creative. And thinking about integrated care in the NHS as well, so how, how can we make the NHS work together more closely? How can you get people out of hospital beds more quickly, or better still, prevent them from being hospital in the first place? Thinking about driving down the cost of the whole government with digital public services. And this is something Francis knows about every day. The cost of doing a benefits claim online is about a hundredth of what it is doing it in the traditional paper-based way. Yet only a very small proportion of things have been done in that much more effective way. And lastly, but obviously, we're thinking a lot about the root causes of poverty as well, about trying to go from an approach which is basically you can end poverty just by throwing more benefits at them, just giving people a check to an approach which is about dealing with the root causes, thinking about, as we are at the moment, things like the care system, a terrible record uh, of our adoption fostering systems, uh, thinking about teenage pregnancy, family breakdown, drugs and addictions, all those other core causes of crime. Uh, sorry, the causes of poverty. So we've, we've done a lot in the last 10 years and we're doing a lot now. And that's why it's nice to see you to be able to take a step back from that kind of blizzard of pamphlets and activity and think about the big picture. And to, in particular, think about um, looking backwards to the last 10 years, Francis Cross's the Godfather of Policy Change, instrumental in its creation, to what's happened in terms of the agenda over the last 10 years and where it's going to go uh, next. I mean, Francis really doesn't need any introduction, particularly amongst this audience, because of course he is our godfather. It is worth saying though that there is a nice piece which I flag up to you today in the Daily Mail headlined Francis Moore, come on, most influential Tory of his generation. <laughs> which is, um, uh, we may have dropped you in at the Prime Minister, that probably is under the feeling of Tory of his generation. Uh, so sorry to have dropped in. Uh, you're in it with the Prime Minister, but no, let's thank you for my job, and thank you for creating policy change, and thank you for coming here this evening. Francis. Well, Neil, thank you very much indeed for that uh, very kind introduction. I'm delighted that all the work that policy exchange has done on job creation has at least resulted in the creation of your job. <laughs> 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 uh, but I'm sure that uh, uh, if you haven't, uh, 
got this, you would be doing something even more illustrious, if such a thing can be imagined. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a, a great pleasure to be invited to uh, celebrate um, Policy Change's 10th birthday, and the, the essay question I was set was uh, uh, 10 years of modernization looking back and, and the challenges ahead. So I'll talk a little bit about that. It is, of course, 10 years ago since the group of us founded two new institutions. Uh, one was Conservatives to Change, uh, or Sea Change, we called it, and Policy to Change, obviously, was the second. Sea Change was an overtly political group. It was promoting the modernization of the Conservative Party. I was its chairman, and our hope was that Sea Change would not be needed for long. Our task was to point out why the Conservative Party was failing to gain any electoral traction at that time. This was 2001, 2002, and to point out what the remedies might be. We made ourselves redundant. We thought when after the 2005 election, I became party chairman, and six months later, David Cameron became party leader. My speech at the 2005 party conference was in some ways the culmination of Sea Change's mission. Uh, in it, I spelled out, uh, sometimes I fear with brutal honesty, what I thought was needed. It was not, quite as it was pointed out at the time, the typical uh, Chan's uh, speech uh, designed to rouse the uh, enthusiasm of uh, the grassroots. I showed with what is still sometimes described as Francis's killer slide <laughs> how voters confronted with the party's immigration policy, if it was presented in a neutral way, blind as to its origin supported it by two to one. But when told that it was a conservative policy, the proportions reversed. <laughs> this was all about the motives that were uh, uh, attached to us. Uh, I remember during this period a discussion with the editorial team at a leading conservative newspaper <laughs> making this case. Uh, I was asked this, was I saying that sound conservative ideas uh, would damage the conservative party? No, I replied, the reverse. The Conservative Party, as it was then seen, was damaging good conservative policies. This is where the missions of sea change and policy exchange overlapped. Policy exchange was explicitly not associated, nor could it have been, with the Conservative Party. It was intended to be an independent policy institute, promoting innovative thinking from a centre-right standpoint, particularly in areas that had largely escaped the attention of the party itself. It was mostly uh, Archie Norman's idea, he gets the blame, and I raised the money uh, and hired Nick Bowles to be its first director. Together we recruited Michael Gove to be its first champ, having taken the unusually perhaps self-effacing position that its board should contain no active politicians. In those early days, it struggled uh, for attention and, frankly, for money. So often Nick Bowles would phone me up, I would get out my Rolodex and make some calls, and we struggled through to the next payday. Uh, it was uh, felt then like a cottage industry, while today it describes the policy landscape like a colossus. We wanted policy exchange at the start to focus on four policy areas public service reform, decentralization or localism, uh, internationalism, uh, and the environment. The point was, uh, rather explicitly, to develop new centre-right thinking and solutions to the issues that people most care about, but which the Conservative Party at that time seemed to ignore. Ten years ago, just before we launched Policy Exchange, I delivered the R.A. Butler lecture. I entitled it, deliberately provocatively, Modernise or Die. And while I want to revisit some of the ideas, the policy ideas that in that speech, I think it's important to say pretty obvious really, that modernization did not begin in 2002 any more than as Philip Larkin suggested that sexual intercourse began in 1963. <laughs> uh, modernization uh, has been going on for a very long time. The Conservative Party is the oldest and most successful party in the history of democracy. To survive and succeed over those centuries, it has had continually to modernize and involve. It is manifestly not the same party uh, that William Pitt the Younger uh, was leader, let alone William Pitt the Elder. Uh, when we have failed to modernize and evolve, when we fail to understand and influence the spirit of the age, the electorate 
has rightly punished us. We can sometimes forget now how bleak the outlook was back 10 years ago. The course of history has a tendency with hindsight to look inevitable, and as we look back from our present vantage point, we could be mistaken for thinking that the party's revival and recovery was somehow bound to happen, that the electoral cycle was bound to turn, the wheel would come our way, uh, and uh, we would return to government. It wasn't bound to happen. Yes, in my Butler lecture then, and in my 2005 conference speech, I did use somewhat apocalyptic language. Uh, I said for the party it was five to midnight. There was no guarantee that we would even uh, retain second place. I was described by one commentator as the private phrase of the Conservative Party, forever crying, we're doomed. Telling the brutal truth to a party still largely in denial at that time was a minority pastime. Not many of us were doing it, but it needed to be said and done. So modernization is a strand running right through the Conservative Party's history. It is paradoxically one of the party's strongest traditions. We are, after all, the party who more than a century ago made a man born into a Jewish family prime minister, the party that sent the first female MP to Westminster, and of course the party of the first woman prime minister. We legislated to introduce women peers into the upper chamber, and in government now we'll legislate to introduce same-sex marriage. But we've also, from time to time, been on the wrong side of the debate. And when we were, and when we are again, there's no doubt we will be. We must have the courage to say so, to accept that we were wrong and to change. The Conservative Party will always suffer if it's seen to be always trying to turn the clock back to an imagined golden era. You can't drive policy looking through a rose-tinted rearview mirror. If we're seen as being defined by backward-looking social attitudes, we will be seen as unacceptable and unelected. In the 1990s and beyond, uh, we were wrong about minority rights. I've spoken before how my brother's untimely death from AIDS brought home to me that Section 28, legislated as it was for honest motives, had come to represent an attitude of intolerance that alienated a multitude of decent citizens with conservative instincts, but who saw us as a result of that as hostile to them. I remember a conversation a decade ago with a conservative commentator who asked why the party continued to oppose gay marriage. Don't you see, he asked, that it's a deeply conservative idea to allow people, whatever their sexuality, to make a public commitment to each other. It's one of those moments of insight that can shape politics. In my conference speech of 2005, I recounted how a voter I'd met in Crawley, the marginal seat, who'd said something that really shocked me. A former conservative voter, she said she wouldn't vote for us because our party didn't approve her word of her. Why not, I asked? Because she said, I'm a single mother. And that's why some of what I said in that Butler lecture uh, 10 years ago was about inclusiveness. Inclusiveness was regarded by some at the time as being a fluffy and superficial concern. Some of it, yes, was about candidate selection, much of which we've remedied, not all, but much more <coughs> now. But most of it was about being a national party, a party for the cities as well as for the countryside and suburbs, a party as much for its non-white citizens as for the white, for women who work and unmarried couples as much as for full-time mothers and the married. We've done much to remedy this. Not enough, we're still too absent as a force in the great cities. And despite having a parliamentary party today much more representative of modern Britain than ever before, too few black and minority ethnic Britons see us as their natural home, even when their values chime uh, with ours. The Conservative Party can never let up in its drive to show Britain that we are, as Disraeli put it, a national party, or we're nothing. So what then of policy direction? What should a modern Conservative Party offer for the future? Looking back a decade, well, actually three decades since my, nearly three decades since my political career began. I remember in most ways the same, I remain in most ways the same conservative I've always been. Fiscal conservative, <coughs> economic liberal, a realistic, Eurosceptic, uh, and a defender of civil liberty. But I suppose it's on 
social questions that I've changed the most, that the party has changed the most as well, and indeed the British society has changed the most. Like the British society, the Conservative Party has had the suppleness that allows it to adapt to a new moment, a new time, and to absorb the spirit of the age. Not because we lack conviction, but because unlike the Labour Party, we never have been a party of dogma. Yes, we have long believed in certain basic ideas, in freedom, in security, in aspiration, in equality of opportunity. But around these basic ideas, much else has and will continue to evolve. This ability to evolve, to adapt, when we allow it to happen, lets us be in touch with society in a way that a party based on dogma never can be. Being pragmatic rather than dogmatic means we shouldn't arrogantly assume we always know best and the society should conform to our expectations rather than us adapting to evolving social norms. So how does today's conservatism shape up to what I speculated about in my Butler lecture 10 years ago? Well, not too badly, really. I said then we needed to focus on four themes. The first, I very inelegantly, and for want of a better tag, described as groupism. This I meant to be voluntary collective neither the state collectivism that had comprehensively failed, nor the sterile individualism uh, that conservatism had become caricatured as in the 1980s. Today we call this the big society, or as I put it then, smaller state, bigger citizens, stronger society. Then second, there was liberalism, or decentralization, long favored by oppositions and rapidly abandoned by governments. <laughs> At last, with the strong commitment of both Conservatives and Liberal Democrats, it has become a hallmark of the coalition government and is the theme running through our reforms of education, health, police and local government. Third was social justice, which I characterised then as being less about redistribution than about genuine opportunity for all, with emphasis on serious welfare reform, tackling multi-generational deprivation and promoting the neighbourly society. Ian Duncan Smith has brilliantly taken this theme and turned it into a centerpiece of the government's program. Under this head, I argued, well before it was fashionable, actually, for the business community to recognise the obligations beyond those that are strictly legal, that a consensus in favour of capitalism imposes, a consensus that might have been a slightly uh, impaired since then, but the obligation remains. As I put it then, this theme must be central to modern conservatism, that obligations freely undertaken and cheerfully discharged are the bonds that bind society and the community together. The fourth theme was around internationalism, a plea that Euroscepticism should not lead to isolationism, that we should recognize our self-interest as well as our obligation to attack poverty wherever it arose. Our commitment today, at a time of fiscal retrenchment, to increase our overseas aid budget has amply met the end that I sketched out there. These themes stand up, I think, well 10 years on. For in the intervening years, the last government went down paths that made radical change even more necessary <coughs> than it seemed in 2002. For 13 years, Labour thought they knew best. They thought that a narrow, white wall elite in Westminster <coughs> knew best. They didn't trust people. They wouldn't give people real choice and over how they should run their lives. They patronized people and smothered in a bubble wrap of, of bureaucracy. Labour's uh, nanny state sought to molly bottle and micromanage from cradle to grave. But a controlled people can never be free, and that's why conservatives needed to break down the concentrated power of the state and through decentralization return power to the people. And in government were doing this, including Introducing directly elected police and crime commissioners to give the public a say in how our streets are policed, introducing more city mayors and a more open and transparent politics. But we need to go further. We need a wholesale decentralization of power back to local areas. This will strengthen the fabric of society, build social capital, and ultimately make our institutions at every level more effective. So, where now? Well, I'm going to say something that may sound a little surprising. Conservative, Karl Marx was right about one thing at least. Alienation is a central problem in modern society. For people who do not own feel alienated. They feel dispossessed from control 
over their own destiny. Of course, Marx wasn't right about the solution, but this is a problem which conservatives can solve. And a big part of the solution is to spread ownership further. This was already identified by the conservatives, certainly in the last half of the last century, who worked to create a property-owning democracy that really came into its fullest flowering under Margaret Thatcher. We did this because we understood that giving people a stake, an asset that they own themselves, would give them ownership, would give them independence through ownership, and would allow them to relate to one another in a more meaningful way. And ultimately, a strong society rests upon strong and independent people. So how can we rise to the challenge of alienation in our time? Yes, by consolidating and expanding on the successes of our past through the property and in democracy. So a renewal of the right to buy is long overdue, but we must go further if we're to improve the lives for everyone. A central means, I believe, will be by encouraging mutuals, cooperatives, and social enterprises to spin out of the public sector so that workers can take control of their destiny, can have accountability and responsibility for what they do and what they deliver, can give effect in the most open and free way to the public service ethos, their public service vocation. Mutuals and cooperatives give workers ownership over their work, and with ownership can end alienation. It's happening already, building on the back of work we did in opposition, and some very modest advances made by uh, the last government. Today, more than a billion pounds worth of NHS services are already provided by mutuals. No longer should we in government feel imprisoned by having to make a binary choice between public services being delivered by bureaucratic, monolithic public sector monopolists on the one hand, or straight outsourcing or privatization to commercial providers on the other. Mutuals, cooperatives, and social enterprises uh, often offer ways, many, many occasions will be in partnership with private sector providers in a joint venture to provide uh, services well beyond these simplistic opposites. So we've introduced a Mutuals Pathfinder program to demonstrate the benefits of employee-led organizations across public services. Because from social care to school, IT support, spinning out into a Mutual can deliver benefits for the workforce, the customers, and for the taxpayer. Giving staff ownership over their work, even if not in a financial sense, for many of these Mutuals choose, the staff themselves choose to operate in a not-for-profit organization. It can dramatically improve productivity. Workers feel empowered and liberated. One healthcare provider with over a thousand staff found that annual absenteeism fell by no less than a half after spinning out. I remember visiting one health uh, care mutual being created, where as I was going around the ward, uh, a member of the staff, the nurse, said, come into the storeroom, or something I want to show you uh, in the storeroom. I went into the storeroom and on all of the racks containing blood sets, hypodermics, all the other bits of kit that they use, some of them meticulously put a sticker with the unit price, the unit cost of each item. And uh, so I said, well, it's great that you've done that. And then they told me that it had brought demand down because people could see how much it was costing. And, and, and I said, well, why did you do it? Because you're a not-for-profit. You're not going to gain financially uh, from doing this. And they said, well, it's very simple. Every pound we save by being careful with the money, we can ourselves put into improving the care for the people we're here to serve. It was a moment of, of profound insight. The productivity benefits of doing this accrue not just to the taxpayer, because that's a contract where the cost of the taxpayer is going to fall by a third over the four-year period of the contract. The cost of the ben benefit of the taxpayer clear, but the benefits to the users of the services as well. To drive this further, we're developing a suite of rights to provide where public sector workers can request to take over the running of services. Today, rather shockingly, more than half of every pound of our nation's income is spent by the state. And while we all know the dangers of private sector monopolies, we think all too little about the perils of state monopolies over state service provision. The state is an inherently monopolistic entity and the state monopoly can be the enemy of enterprise. Within the public sector, 
there's a legion of entrepreneurs, latent entrepreneurs, fired with the public service ethos, but deeply frustrated with the constraints imposed by the monolith within which they're imprisoned. Liberating them as leaders of a new cohort of public service mutuals can create a whole new enterprise sector in our economy, a serious supply side reform whose economic benefits we're only just beginning to grasp. But the benefits of mutuals are not just financial. Across British society today, there's a general sense of alienation which often manifests itself as apathy. An administered people with no sense of ownership over a government that's become more, that became more impenetrable than ever before, will feel alienated from the state and dangerously from society itself. We need to, need to give the state back to the people. We need to allow society to thrive and grow alongside the state and not despite it. The greatest tool for this is transparency. Knowledge, as Francis Bacon said, is power and greater transparency can lead to a rebalancing of power and accountability between governments and large organizations and individuals. Data is invaluable raw material, and opening it up gives people choices and opportunities they've never had before. And transparency is already transforming public services in parts of the UK, where the National Health Service has published data on local medical practices Thousands of patients have exercised their right of choice and moved to services which reported better standards. The more mundane level is making life more convenient for London commuters who can uh, use their the apps on their iPhones to decide, because they can see when their bus is coming, do I have time to uh, grab a cup of coffee? Do I need to run for the bus? Not life or death, for sure, but it had improvement to a, a measurable improvement people's lives. <coughs> Transparency is not soft or fluffy. It's hard-edged and vigorous. It takes governments out of their comfort zone. <coughs> the future is open, and conservatives are making transparency a defining characteristic of our future public policy. Last autumn, we made wor literally world-leading commitments to open up more public sector data that will make travel easier and healthcare better and create significant growth for industry and jobs in the UK because uh, public data sets are actually a feedstock for new industries that fe fueling economic growth and also social growth. There's a huge growth in social capital when developers and social entrepreneurs can use uh, the data to generate knowledge about communities. At the heart of what we're doing is building a two-way data relationship between the state and society. We're in the first formative years of a new age of open data, and although there are risks and challenges ahead, the prize is an effective and personalized 21st century democracy. The prize is empowered citizens rather than administered citizens. Citizens who can expose corruption, get the best value out of their governments, and have equal access to valuable information. In the future, we face challenges including climate change, energy use, security, aging populations, and migration. We need our critical infrastructure and services to be more aware, more interactive, and more efficient. <coughs> Open data will be crucial in making that happen and allowing it to happen. Have no doubt, as we become increasingly data rich, we'll look back and wonder how we ever tolerated collective ignorance that we have had in the past. Well, I said in 2002, the Conservative Party is a phoenix, not a dodo. We did rise again from what felt uncomfortably close to ashes 10 years ago. We did so through David Cameron's brave and inspiring leadership, and because we finally reverted to the great tradition of modernization. We're very close today to being the genuinely contemporary party, proud of the past, but looking to the future. We're the radical reformers with powerful ideas for how Britain can itself revive and thrive. Policy exchange was never for the Conservative Party. Its mission was and remains to reinvigorate a bubbling intellectual ferment around centre-right policy. It's done so consistently based on compendious evidence and rigorous research, not on grand <coughs> assertion or specious argument. It's done much more and it's meant much more 
than its founders ever dreamed of. To Charles Moore and Danny Finkelstein and Neil O'Brien, who between them took it from its modest and beleaguered beginnings to its present strength and profile, I give congratulations and encouragement. <coughs> the work is never done. The next 10 years will demand at least as much or more as the last 10 years. Thank you. Now we do have a little bit of time for some questions and answers too. Um, if you want to do the usual drill, put your hand up, tell us who you are and where you're from, and uh, then we'll uh, maybe take them into the bunks. I'll start over that. Hello, Francis. Sir uh, Harry Quinn from BBC. I'd love to know what you think about freedom of information, given your modernising agenda, the uh, desire for openness. You know that Gus O'Donnell and the Prime Minister have both complained about the requests for um, freedom of information as regards the cabinet. What's your view on it? Should, uh, should there be a change? Should there be a change in the legislation regarding cabinet discussions? Well, it's not just the present Prime Minister. It's uh, Tony Blair, who introduced it, has uh, uh, roundly denounced its effects. And one of the many things, you know, I, he has regretted. A <coughs> hotly contested in field, I've got to say. Um, <laughs> and, um, uh, and I think the issue that needs to be addressed is to provide real protection around that area of policy, discussion, and advice. It is very bad for good government if officials feel unable, candidly, to give advice to ministers for fear that in a short period it may be uh, opened up. Uh, we, the one thing you do not want government is to be, for it to be based on bland advice. What we should increasingly do is be willing to disclose the evidence on which uh, decisions are made. And actually the process of taking further and further, opening up data, pushing data out into the public arena, that goes some way to meet that, but we should be more open about the evidence and more protective about the discussion whether it's in cabinet or cabinet committees, or in the way in which officials give advice to ministers. Because actually you want that to be really, really candid. You want officials to feel encouraged in the time-honored phrase to tell truth unto power. And that won't happen if there's a fear that the Information Commission or the Tribunal can at any stage uh, go behind that wall and force its disclosure. So you do think the cabinet should be Oh, cabinet discussion should be exempt from the FOI legislation. Well, well the uh, legislation is very clear that it should be, uh, except in exceptional circumstances. The problem is that no one ever quite knows what the exceptional circumstances are. And it's that anxiety about it is, that could lead, and <coughs> has, I think, in the past led to advice being um, smoothed out uh, and uh, made more bland. <laughs> Towards the back of the room, so we might as well come over to you. Uh, Alex Dean, Weber Shandwick. Uh, you've spoken about a number of things that your party's got right over the years, um, in the last 10 years particularly. If you had to pick one thing which your party is still getting wrong, what would it be? Uh, well, that's an uh, enormous temptation, which I'm going to find not the slightest difficulty in resisting. <laughs> You talked about localism. One of the challenges around going too far down the localism route is you very quickly get into nimbyism. And we face in this country some huge infrastructure challenges that require top level leadership to give the nation what it needs. And that at times will require sacrifice at the individual level. How do you going to draw the balance between the national need and the local issues? Well, as far as national infrastructure is concerned, there is a national infrastructure, I think, is it called a plan? 
do I see Greg Clark then? Is that the case? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we need to be open about where there is a project which is of national importance and deal with it in that way. And we should be grown up about that. Um, but most, uh, most planning is not about local, is, is not about national, of national significance. And I think that what we're aiming, Greg's much better qualified to answer this than me, um, he said rapidly. Um, <laughs> the, but the way in which the planning system has operated uh, up till now, and we're in transition at the moment, uh, is that um, the benefits from uh, new planning developments have all seemed to accrue to the benefit of the new communities in the case of housing development, and not at all to the benefit of the existing communities who see it all as downside. You know, they get a new development, the view spoil, countryside intruded on, uh, pressure placed on their infrastructure. <coughs> and actually, I think the way in which we're putting together the package is to enable there to be a much more uh, creative um, negotiation almost between the existing communities uh, who do stand to benefit and the local council and the developers who want to uh, do new development to see how you can configure development in a way that provides benefit to the new, the existing communities as much as to the, to the new communities. So it, it is, we'll take time for that new dynamic, which neither, frankly, council nor local communities in many cases are at the moment geared up to engage in, nor are developers for the most part um, attuned to this kind of, um, to this kind of uh, dialogue. And having set up the new MPLA, are you going to drive that agenda through? Because that's precisely where you've created the opportunity now to articulate the benefits of running the programme with the SROs across government, rather than just taking an individual narrow project perspective. The MPLA, the major major projects, uh, the National Academy. Yeah. Well, I mean that's that's about uh, that's a kind of different issue. That's about addressing the. Um, Failures that there have been uh, in managing major projects, um, and it's not about kind of very kind of ground level project management skills. It's about giving senior officials, uh, permanent secretaries, and those who are the senior responsible owners of big projects, um, some decent uh, background. And it's really, I would say, it's about telling them what good looks like. Actually, more of a more bad type of like, what are the warning signs of something going wrong? Um, and people should not be in a position um, of ha having senior responsibility for very major projects. I mean, our, we have a portfolio of 200 major projects, uh, which are under the purview of the Major Projects Authority, which sits with me in the Treasury. It's the lifetime cost of those projects added up together is reckoned to be about 400 billion. If we can improve performance on those, um, and uh, Lord Brown, who's been very instrumental in, in us setting up the major projects in Egypt Academy, uh, he believes that we can improve performance by at least 10% uh, by improving the project leadership skills. No, 40 billion. Kind of worth having. And there's a lady in red. Thank you. Um, Amy Jackson, formerly a CCHQ staffer and now government affairs at Tesco. Um, our candidate in Glasgow Central, after one election hustings in 2010, was approached by a voter who said, although rather fruity in that bridge, I agree with every word you say, but I can never vote for a Tory. Haven't we failed as a national party if our modernisation process or the, 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 the rethinking that we've gone through hasn't connected with voters in every part of the country, and particularly with the referendum coming up? Well, I mean, I don't think it's binary, totally failed or totally succeeded. We succeeded hugely. I mean, we uh, massively improved our performance in the north of England and in Wales. Uh, where, from where we retreated um, in, the north, in the north of England. Uh, our visible presence of the party had, had massively depleted and between 2005 and the years after that. We, we built it up um, and a lot of it was about kind of basic stuff. I mean, more professionals on the ground. 
uh, campaign centers from which people could operate. You know, just being visible, showing that we were there, enabled us to win a lot of seats in the north of England. Scotland, um, uh, it, the future of the Conservative Party in Scotland has to be designed in Scotland by Conservatives in Scotland. Um, uh, I sometimes have said that when I was party chairman, I had quite a good idea how we could revive, how the party in Wales and the north of England could be revived. And by and large, we did it, and by and large, it worked. I didn't know, and I candidly said so at the time, how we revived the Conservative Party in Scotland. It has to come from Scotland. Devolution changed the political landscape in Scotland much more uh, than, in, than in Wales. And, and um, we, need to, uh, we need to find the heartbeat in a way that we possibly haven't yet done. What's the Craig? <coughs> Michael Craig uh, from Channel 4 News. Isn't the area where you've really failed in this agenda is that you fail to take the party grassroots with you. Uh, and we mentioned a number of policy areas where there's still huge scepticism within the party grassroots. The Green Agenda, Overseas Aid, probably Gay Marriage, Police Commissioners, uh, and, and so on and so on. <coughs> that, in a way, I has the impression that it's a bit like Blair. People always used to say about Blair that he would rather prefer he didn't have uh, a, a party grassroots. And in a way, wouldn't your agenda be much easier if you didn't have a party grassroots? Well, and isn't there an inherent party. contradiction in a lot of what you've said? In that you talk about localism, or it were, but localism and decentralisation, but that for not the ten, last 10 years, you and other party chairmen and leaders have actually been more centralist um, and less focused uh, than, any, than the party ever been before. Well, if you don't have grassroots, you don't have grass. Um, and <laughs> you can't have a party without grassroots. I'm very fond of that. Um, the, but if you look at the thing uh, we talked about way back then, and I was very much involved with as party chairman, um, uh, widening the uh, representativeness, if you want a better word, of our bench of candidates, particularly in safe seats and, and winnable seats. Um, that's the one thing over which party grassroots have most control. Um, and I remember quite soon after the 2005 election, I did an event uh, where uh, some, a cross-party event about um, uh, enlarging the number of women in men's parliament. And I remember a senior Labour person saying rather patronisingly to me, he said, well, Francis, I hear what you say about sort of encouragement and exaltation and all of that. And he almost sort of patted me on the head and said, but it won't work. In the Labour Party, we didn't uh, change the um, emphasis on selecting white men until we introduced compulsory all women shortlists. And he said, when that was outlawed by the courts and until we legislated to allow it again, we defaulted absolutely back to selecting <coughs> just white men again. Uh, and, and my response to him was, well, you may be right, and we may be sort of whistling up an alley and it may not work, but I tell you, if it does work, then we will have changed, the, or the Conservative Party will have changed in a way that the Labour Party didn't change. And actually, was I completely happy with the number of women candidates we uh, selected and got elected? No, it would have been good for it to have been more, but it was a massive increase in the number in, that there had ever been before. It's a huge increase. Um, so far as black and minority ethnic candidates, uh, it's, uh, it, again, it's a huge increase. Uh, and I mean, and we didn't, there was no dumbing down or in, um, fudging it to in, enable more um, uh, women and BME candidates to get through on a lower quality. These are outstandingly able uh, people. Um, and, and the point I would just make to you, Michael, is that all of those local conservative associations that selected openly gay candidates, that selected BME candidates, that selected women candidates, every single one of them 
had the option and could have selected someone like me. Uh, and they didn't. And that reflects not that we enforced centrally change on the grassroots, but that Conservative Party membership changed and decided to change. And that reflects, I think, that change happened much deeper in the Conservative Party, actually, than it did in the Labour Party. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Charles Moore of the Telegraph. Um, Francis, when you conceived uh, modernization, you conceived it at a time when you assumed that the economy <coughs> was more or less all right. Um, things then changed, and uh, it wasn't, and it indeed isn't. Um, this must affect your attitude to modernization, and <coughs> if you think what you rightly said about the paradoxically called the tradition of modernization, um, a, a very important aspect of modernization was, of course, economic in the late 70s, early 80s, so there was a massive change um, brought about at that time. That would now seem to be the missing bit, isn't it? You, you said a little bit about energy, and that was interesting to hear, but it seemed a little bit marginal. What is the great economic modernization which is going to um, you know, get people moving now and is constant with, the, with the, all the other things you're talking about? Well, I mean, I said, um, I said you know, from, from my kind of core beliefs, I remain a fiscal conservative. In fact, I mean, when I was shadow chancellor back in, uh, when we first started kind of talking about modernization, uh, I think the phrase I tended to use at the time was the government was storing up problem, trouble for the future, mortgaging the future. And my God, they did. And that was uh, way before it was found. Um, and, um, and, and the trend was really spotted. So I think fiscal conservatism, um, economic liberalism, uh, a desire uh, for um, the supply side reform never stands still. You never reach a point of perfect equilibrium where it's all fine. Because actually, you know, all governments have an inbuilt tendency, whatever their hue, whatever their time or location, to do two things, to spend more money and to regulate more. Um, and you know, it is uh, a result of what I think Sir Humphreys called the politician syllogism. Uh, something must be done, this is something, therefore we must do it. <laughs> and and something, that, uh, something that comes to hand is, is legislate, regulate, because you, you wave it around, we've done something, we'll spend money. And these are the soft options, the easy things. The tougher things to do are to stand back from that and find different solutions which rely on, on voluntarism, uh, on behavior change, um, and, 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 and so on. So um, uh, I don't have any sort of um, radically modern approach to supply side reform. Um, the, the, the one say that we should constantly seek to create in this country the very best environment for people to do business. Um, a, a sensible regulatory environment, a tax regime that encourages people to want to come and put their money to work and their ideas and their energy to work here. I always remember when I was taking a finance bill through uh, in, in the very early 90s, a Labour MP saying to me, really very indignantly, he said, you're just trying to turn Britain into a tax haven. And I said, thank you, that's the nicest compliment you could have made. <laughs> and, and I treated it uh, uh, as much encouragement. Um, so, um, but I would, I, I would just say, I mean, the one thing I think we, the, the, the new idea that is powerful is, um, it is the public sector mutuals, the spin-outs from the public sector, um, uh, because that, is uh, both of all the evidence is it can lead to the public services themselves being much improved at a better, a lower cost. Um, but also, and uh, this I think I, we didn't fully understand when we kind of developed this, but, but it's just going and visiting the groups of people who are doing this and the leaders um, who, who are uh, inspiring it. It's this thing that there are entrepreneurs people who are natural entrepreneurs, who are not going to be commercial entrepreneurs necessarily, but who have entrepreneurial temperaments uh, and, and skills, and they're buried in uh, the uh, public sector and find it frustrating. And it's this thing that actually liberate them, very often put them alongside 
um, those with commercial sectors, my private sector partners, and we we will create rather in a way, a way analogous to how in the 1980s Britain blazed a trail in privatization, which was then followed around the world. It's possible. I don't want to make extravagant claims for it, then, but it's possible that what we're starting to do here with mutual spin-outs from the public sector will start a similar trend. There's a huge amount of interest in it, um, but it will, it, it's not easy to do, but it can be a, a big part of um, invigorating the supply side of the economy. Mm -hmm. That's time for just maybe one or two last questions. If you don't mind, we'll try to take some together in a group, so we're going to take three together. Jeff, when you're there, lady over there, and then Jeff will just... Thank you. Christian Guy from the Centre for Social Justice. It was during the talking about social justice and the redefinition of policy as part of the modernisation agenda. What more do you think can be done to take the party with you on that and to convince them that poverty really matters for the future of the Conservative Party? How can you reach out, do you think, to poorer voters and convince them that they are right at home in the Conservative Party, particularly in view that the Lib Dems may be trying to position themselves at the heart of the Galatian government and the Conservatives as their head? It's all that block present that's very, very good question. There's a lady just over here. Caroline Buckingham, Asian Architects. Um, I believe you were the architect who uh, broke down the Quangos. In my experience going forward, they seem to be springing up again and rebranded and renamed. Just wanted to know if that's still very much central to your agenda. So the end is more Yes, um, David Henke, Exaro News, freelance journalist, Tribune, etc. Um, uh, I'd like to ask a question about the mutualisation. Um, in the 1980s, you didn't mention the bus companies, which were, if you remember, bought out as management buyouts, and we had lots of competition. But within a very short time, they became one bus company with no competition. What's isn't it possible that your plan could end up all being known by private equities and Morgan Stanley and all your past and that, and possibly like our tax offices run from the Cayman Islands or owned in the Cayman Islands? And is there, because the entrepreneurial zeal might be, let's make a fast buck out of this within a year? Mm. Well, I'll deal with that one um, first. Uh, what, what is striking? is in how many of the mutuals which are coming about, the staff themselves are electing for it to be a not-for-profit. Um, they're not buying, doesn't bind them in forever, they can choose to change that over time, but it's really interesting that, um, that they mostly are deciding um, to, to uh, run it as a, as a not-for-profit. And yet they still feel that it's really interesting and kind of quite uplifting to hear people talking about how they feel like owners and they feel they can make a difference. They feel, they know, they, and it's certainly the case, they can hold their management to account. Um, I mean, Charlie Mayfield, the chairman of John Lewis, <coughs> and we went and talked, visited one of these mutuals together. And he said, uh, uh, he, when he was talking to the staff, he said, most chief executives will say, um, I work for the staff, they don't work for me. And it's mostly not true. He said, in my case, it's mutually true. The staff can sign me. And that sense in a mutual that there is some real element of control. And this is not just about a bit of uh, ownership. I mean, the, the one that we are working on at the moment, which is, I hope, fairly close to uh, ask it, we may seem to be pregnant at some time, and we're getting to birth quite soon, the organization that administers civil service pension scheme. Um, the staff will have 25% of, of the equity. Now, the significance of that, that's the level at which um, the Employee Benefit Trust, which owns the shares on half the staff, can block a special resolution. So it's not positive control, but it's an important element of negative control, which gives people a, 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 the feeling of ownership, which is really important. So will some of them sell out and make a quick buck? Um, maybe. Um, but actually, that's not the spirit which infuses uh, most of these. And where we do, uh, we create an entity like that, the government will itself retain a carried interest in it so that if, um, and also we're really keen to make sure that there is not scope for the management to benefit disproportionately. Um, 
but if their staff do benefit because they've run something terrific and they've built something vigorous and great and they do choose to exit, that's fine, but the government will benefit, and the taxpayer will benefit as well. Uh, point about uh, the mangoes um, and uh, is it um, are we are we continuing? Uh, uh, yes, we are. I mean, it's. Um, uh, I said when we announced the results of the first um, review, which was done pretty quickly, uh, that it was a work in progress. Uh, what we had, what we put in train, was a series of triennial reviews. Because what happened was um, uh, previous governments, including our own, to be honest, was a bit incontinent in in producing uh, um but not. I mean, quicker to create them than to uh, remove them. And, and the reason for that is that it's you generally, for the significant one, you need primary legislation to create it. But you also, therefore, need primary legislation to get rid of it. And while you create it as part of the great excitement of the bill and the act doing whatever it is you're doing, then to get legislation later just to get rid of it or reform it is difficult. That's why we the Public Bodies Act, which enables us to use a truncated uh, parliamentary procedure to uh, uh, address uh, future changes. Because the final review, so every, every three years, every mango will be submitted to the test of do we need it at all, does it need to be independent, and so on. And, and so that, it, it, uh, that will continue. There will be some new ones occasionally being created. Uh, we will endeavor to keep them to a minimum. Um, how do we persuade the, um, your question about, about poverty? Um, uh, well, I mean, I think it is important to make the point that, that you do not cure poverty just by redistributing um, the uh, and, uh, and the concept of child poverty um, is, is an odd one, actually, um, because all children are poor. Um, um, they, it's about the family they grow up in, actually. I mean, children have, are poor or not poor to the extent their parents are, are poor or not poor. Uh, the key thing is, children who are born into poverty, that they have a way of coming out of poverty. And that's why the equality of opportunity, that's why uh, Michael Goves reforms to schooling, uh, which are proceeding much dramatically quicker and more effectively than anyone dreamed was even possible are so important uh, for this, uh, from this um, uh, point of view. Um, and you know, I think Conservatives get it. I don't sense any kind of reluctance about it um, at all. Uh, and so far as poverty across the globe is concerned, that's controversial. And um, I can't remember who it was, was it Michael said, um, you know, do all Conservatives do, it does everyone sign up to what we've committed to, which is quite a controversial thing to do, uh, to commit to increase uh, the time of fiscal retrenchment, to increase uh, continuously the um, uh, level of uh, spending on international development. And, uh, and that's a hard-headed argument of national interest about this, um, which is we gain influence, we get credibility uh, in, particularly when you bring together much more um, what we're doing in international development with our work on um, conflict prevention and conflict resolution and our diplomatic effort in a way that kind of was all zealously kept apart in, in, under the last government. Um, we can tackle the causes of poverty, which are mostly actually, most poverty around the world is caused by conflict. Um, not by a lack of food, it's conflict causes most poverty, um, and um, by having focused effort, uh, as was done rather effectively, I think, with Somalia two weeks ago, when all of that effort came together. Um, uh, and it's not national. These places of, uh, where conflict leads to poverty, leads to conflict, and a ghastly spiral, those are the breeding grounds for terrorism. We have a hard-headed national interest in tackling it, and in tackling it in a more focused way than was done in the past. Very good. I'm afraid we are now completely out of time. Um, Francis, thank you. I know you're incredibly busy man, sir, and, and so grateful to be having, having made it here this evening. I was struck by how, how rich in various paradoxes your speech was. You talked about um, you know, the tradition of modernization. It turned out the future of conservative modernization 
was to be quoting from Karl Marx and advocating setting up workers' cooperatives. So the Republican Party is sort of Michael Foote. Um, but I'm um, no, uh, It is a pleasure to have had you here this evening. I thank you again for um, uh, your pivotal role in creating policy change in the first place. And it really, really amazing for us to thank you, Commissioner. Thank you so much.